have a DevOps program at Mutual of Omaha that was that successful, and they really gave me um, the courage to try things um, and take a risk because that, that wasn't really my profile before I joined Mutual. Um, I also see some great oh, Indija is here too. She braved anything I ever asked her to do. She's in Phoenix. Um, and Pam um, Heggie is here and she brought my team brownies and kept them happy because I was a terrible manager. So thank you for that. And um, sh I see some people from Moody's here that I um, want to call out. So Sherry, I'm um, so happy she's um, working with us and our teams. Otherwise I would be the only woman there. So <laughs> thank you for that. So she saves me on a daily basis. Um, anyway, I want to kind of get started. Vihong is one of the best people that I have worked with. And let me tell you, that's a high bar. He um, is fearless. When I first got here, we started um, moving from a platform to a completely new architecture um, from one that had failed. And I want to kind of talk about some of our failures because they're learning opportunities. I don't really consider um, failures. I consider them learning. Um, but there was a lot of pressure when we got here to be successful. And um, when I got there, it was like two weeks before their first install to the new platform. So it was totally terrifying. Um, obviously, I'm still working here. So um, Vahang saved the day. But with that, I'm gonna just kind of start our presentation, if that's all right. Um, so can you guys see my screen? Yes, nod yeah. your head. Oh, yes. thank you, okay, yeah. <laughs> there we go, we're still alive. All right, so I kind of wanna walk through just a little bit about today. Today we're talking about scaling, because you know things are easy when you're doing one or two, but it gets really hard when you're trying to scale things quickly. Um, and so we want to talk about kind of our struggles with containers and what we're doing to get there. We're still on that path um, and how we've had a little success. Um, I'm going to steal a line from Scott Hickey. Uh, he always told us you had to be tall enough to ride the ride and we're not tall enough to ride the ride. So and we know this and that's okay, but we're learning. Um, so I kind of wanted to share some of our struggles that we've had, because I think you'll run into a lot of the same things. Uh, and I hope that we can help you um, not, or at least foresee some of the problems you might run into as you're, as you're going through this. So um, first I wanted to just kind of talk briefly about Moody's. Moody's is a really big company. It's been around like Mutual for over a hundred years. It's founded in 1909 by John Moody. Um, it's publicly traded, so they're very, very lean. Um, they don't have very many employees, like 12,000. Uh, and that's for both divisions. Um, both Fahang and I work for Moody's Analytics, which is um, owned by Moody's. Their headquarters are in New York. Um, and they also, um, you might notice this, their, their largest shareholder is somebody near and dear to your heart, Berkshire Hathaway. Uh, Mr. Warren Buffett, so I'm super happy that he cares about our software. So um, anyway, the, there are two portions of Moody's. So one is the investor services. So you might be familiar with credit ratings or bond ratings. Um, and the reason I point this out is there's, there's two different sections. Moody's Analytics is they, they provide data and analytic tools that they sell to to um, other companies so that they can assess risk. And this isn't like you're buying a house, this is you're buying a bank or something big like that. So um, the reason I point that out is because they, they both are very regulated. And when you're in the cloud, you're gonna care about regulations because you're gonna wanna make sure the services that you have um, will back the legal requirements that you have to meet. Um, I wanted to show this is an older screen. Actually, Moody's is in 44 countries, not um, 29 as it shows here, but you can get an idea of where, where that's at. I have um, a team in Singapore and in India and in the United States. Um, because we're global, we have to have 24 by seven operations. And Vihang has done an awesome job 
the, the Singapore people are great and they keep, they keep them from calling me at night. So I love them. Um, our architects are in San Francisco. And so we have to coordinate a lot with them. Um, working in mutual, I didn't really think a lot about the deployments and how often I probably tortured the infrastructure people. So I have to apologize to any and all of them um, that could be on this call. Um, so now we want to kind of get an idea of where you're at and so that we can customize our, our topics to something that you're interested in. So I'm going to hand it over. So I was muted for while I was talking there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I was like, well, I think they knew to click the button. Yeah, so nope, you guys are rock stars. So thanks, thanks for going ahead and going with that. So we'll give you about 10 more seconds to, or I'll check in in 10 seconds, see how we're doing. Looks like we've got 14 completed. 17. Okay, I'm going to end polling in three, two, one, and share the results. Okay, so quite a bit of people using the cloud extensively. That's good. Yep, that's a good thing actually. Yeah, that's um, that's higher than I would have expected. Is I wonder if that's in production. So I'm guessing it is. Wow, containers, yep. that's a good thing. Well, you might like this talk then. On <laughs> Black Friday, I like that. Okay, um, yes, high availability, all right, we're good then. Then I think uh, that helps, I appreciate you guys taking that so we can make sure we're speaking to our, what our audience wants to listen to. So I'm gonna hand it over to Vihan and we're gonna have just a basic cloud 101 to catch everybody up. And then we're gonna talk through um, some of our, our project and lessons learned. But there was a question, Thank you, why, is that, why is that surprising that so many people um, have some familiarity or are using the cloud? Well, I think a lot of people have concerns about data in the past. They didn't want their data, especially in regulated environments. I know a lot of our banks, for example, um, they, they really don't like their data to be exposed. So we have, there's a lot of exchanges, for example, in the Middle East, and they refuse to use any cloud, anything that's not on-prem. So they do use cloud, but it's not the AWS cloud that, that people might be thinking of or Azure. So um, it just depends on different regions of the world of where they're at um, versus if you're a startup and, and if it's regulated. So, um, so that's interesting to me. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Christy, thank you so much. Uh, I, will, I will basically go over this uh, Cloud 101 uh, uh, concepts. And the first is, why do we consider using the cloud? So when we talk about cloud, there are multiple things uh, that we have to consider. There are, always, there are always pros and cons to that. But we'll be focusing more on the, on the, on the positive side, side of it. So first of all, cloud, uh, cloud computing provides us elastic compute and cost efficiencies which means we don't we only pay for what we use like on demand right uh, then there would be other uh, uh, other cost efficiencies like hey let's if we are going to run a particular server for like let's say uh, one year we'll go for the reservation so so we have all those options uh, when we consider using the cloud when we do on premises so the second point where it says your data on the wrong server <laughs> So, so what could go wrong is, is it means we have to manage a lot of stuff going from networking to storage to servers, virtualization, et cetera, right? So that's why it mentions there are a lot of places and a lot of complications that may arise and we might need a, need a bigger team to you know, handle all of that, right? The third, third is the cloud, your data on someone else's server, right? What it means is, uh, uh, all of these clouds are current are, are actually like if, we, if I specifically talk about AWS, right? AWS is all, is already uh, HIC AA certified, 
and PCI certified, which means your your data is actually compliant, which may need, uh, which may actually meet, as Christy mentioned, to your regular regulatory needs, right? And then the fourth point is the hybrid cloud. What it means by that is, let's say if you are using two different clouds, or you are using uh, AWS or Azure, and then you are also using on-premise. Or, or your data is also on the on-premises and you only use cloud for dr that way it it basically means a hybrid cloud where you use it for some service uh, services and you don't use it for other can we go to the next slide like please okay uh, the fifth one what is the platform as a service or infrastructure as a service uh, so this sorry was that a question? Okay. So what is platform as a service and infrastructure as a service? And I'll cover the first and the second point together. Uh, it depends on, it actually depends on the, uh, on the, on the management on who is managing what, right? So platform as a service is where we manage our application and our data, right? All other all other uh, components like uh, storage, networking, servers, virtualization, etc., is managed by a provider like a vendor called a, or or AWS or Azure or GCP, whatever we want to call it. Um, infrastructure as a service is where we manage application data, our runtime, uh, operating system, and a middleware. Uh, and then software as a service is where we say that hey. We are going to buy a product. We are going to subscribe for the application, but you will manage the application for us. We will not be installing the software on our ser on our servers. That is what software as a service means. Any questions until now? I want to point out something about software as a service briefly. So something that you give up when you subscribe to a hosted service or software as a service is the ability to control things such as maintenance windows. Um, you know, you lose that control. So we struggle a lot because people often will move from an on-premises type application where they could control that kind of timeframes and, you know, the user outages. But when you have hundreds of people using the same platform when when you do a maintenance window change it impacts all of them so um you know you have to make sure when you're talking when your salespeople are talking to your clients and you're building those legal slas that they understand what that is like you can't always give them 24 hours notice or a week's notice um, there are different things that you have to deal with that you lose control over. So just a word of caution, um, because there is some logistics when you're dealing with a customer um, that's different in a host and environment that I didn't really consider. Like you might want to put banner pages up saying your site's going to be down. These are things you should think about as you're, as you're scaling up, because it matters. Thanks, Vihan. Right. Yeah. So also one more thing to add to that, like if, if a customer needs, if, if we can, if, if a customer would need their, their let's say uh, their application for some period of time, we cannot, uh, we cannot put their site under the maintenance window. Otherwise we'll be not meeting the SLA that we require. So as what Christy mentioned, we have to either provide them 24 hour notice or seven days notice, whichever, what is the SLA uh, to, to meet that requirement. Uh, I would also briefly touch on what is the container uh, and wo and why would I use them. Uh, so the container is basically a standard unit of a software which packages up the code and all your dependencies. So what happens is have you have you guys heard about Docker containers, uh, right? So 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 basically how it works is you will have your you will have your operating system or your host and then there would be an engine running on it. Which would which would specify all or where where you can put all your containers, and that can actually uh, scale across multiple compute environments. So let's say in in development, testing, and production, uh, there won't be a differences in the in the operating system we use. Like let's say for example, if Dev uses Python a version like 3.7, and production uses 3.8 or something like that, then there would be weird 
issues that might pop up when we use, start using containers we can easily scale them right and we can easily uh, port over to a different compute all right so that concludes our cloud 101 are there any questions or any other things you'd like Bahan to explain before we move on nope feel free to uh, <laughs> Raise your hand with the emotions if you'd like to, or the, or the reactions rather, or to any questions that you have, you can also put in the chat, and I'll be lo looking for those. Okay, so um, I like this quote, because at the end of the day, if you're going to be in the cloud, you're gonna have to pick one of these kind and um, live with the consequences. And there will be consequences no matter which one you pick. So fear not. All right, I wanted just to show you how much we have been scaling. When I started at Moody's a year and a half ago, um, we weren't in three regions. We have, um, so this, this chart actually represents their two main products. Credit Lens is their hosted or SaaS solution. Lending Cloud, ironically, is not in the cloud and is an on-premise solution. I know that confused me for a really long time. Um, and then, uh, so what they're doing is they're moving these, they're, they're doing conversions from this one product lending cloud to credit lens. And when I started, there was none in using Beanstalk. And so after two weeks, we had to do our first hey deployment. Hey Dan, hold on just a second. Let me stop that presentation. Okay. Okay, hmm. thanks, Dan. Okay, so um, anyway, uh, so after we went through a couple of these, um, I just want to give you an idea of how fast after we built the automation, we were able to scale this. And this is important because this is not a cloud native application. They're taking an on-premise one and they're kind of converting it to a cloud native on the fly. Which mean, which is really bad. They're taking a, well, it's hard to do. I shouldn't say it's bad. They, they, they make a lot of money doing this, but the conversion is difficult is, is really what I mean. So what the problem is, it's not multi-tenant. So it starts messing with your IP spaces and, and different um, things like that. And you run into limitations quickly. So we're, we're kind of, faced with that challenge as we're growing this product, but they have done really well doing this. The, as of 12, 19, they have 383 sites. This is in the Oregon. They have regions in, in Amazon and different parts of the country. So this one is Oregon, which is where most of their sites are hosted. The gray is Ireland, um, which um, is pretty new. And then um, Sydney for the Asia Pacific clients. So this is eight months later. See how much bigger it got? I know that my visuals. So um, now we have grown Ireland and um, Oregon significantly. And you can see that trend where they're, they're able to move those um, lending cloud products over into credit lens. Um, so I'm really proud of the work that the team has done and Vahan, because this has been tough. And we've hit all kinds of roadblocks along the way. We keep hitting them. So I kind of wanted Vahan to walk through this journey a little bit and start kind of showing you where, where we could have maybe made some better decisions or different decisions. And um, hopefully this is stuff that you can take with you as you go through your journey. Um, and then we'll talk through some more specific ones after that. Sure. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Christy. Uh, so basically uh, we used to even before even before christy uh, showed us that uh, screen where it where it had 300 some sites uh, we used to we used to run the application on the on prem uh, data center so our data center is basically in, uh, is with fnts we used to run our application over there where we uh, where we used to actually spin up web servers and deploy the application on it now there was as we started growing like credit lens was our our major uh, solution and had a and had a, a good uh, long uh, road ahead of it uh, 
we started thinking about like how do we want to scale and how do we want to uh, make sure that all the requirements are met so in 2018 uh, now we had a uh, there was a decision made okay let's go with the cloud foundry like an open source cloud foundry uh when we started moving to cloud foundry there was a uh, none of by the way none of the uh, staff members were trained in cloud foundry so we had a training session in in san francisco uh, where they where they got us like okay these are the basics of cloud foundry now as what christy mentioned you have to be tall to ride the ride right so since this is open source since this was open source we had to we did not have any vendor to hold our hand right so we had to figure out any issue that might come up from infrastructure standpoint from networking standpoint anything that might come up would have to be all handled by us so again we we went ahead uh basically cloud foundry we started deploying it in aws itself uh but but it as we started growing more and more into uh, or as we started developing more and more in cloud foundry we started hitting multiple roadblocks right so the roadblocks would be like okay uh let's say my uh, containers uh, or they used to call it as stem cells stem cells are nothing but a, a windows image or or an ami that we used to run inside a uh, on a host so that container used to crash all the time secondly we did, we did not have enough enough logging like uh, okay if the container has crashed what is the actual issue is it the um operating system issue is it the application issue anything so th- that was also one of the major reason like okay if we are going to develop something in non production we need to at least make sure that is working the third thing i would like to bring on is uh, uh when we started doing that we could not even log into those those vms those vm do not have rdp access at all so so it was getting a lot and lot trouble for us to maintain it but again uh when we started migrating one client to cloud foundry there was a massive uh failure uh to the to the stem cells and to the environment now when we started that i still remember we were on a sev one call from on a friday evening from around 4 in the afternoon until 3 am in the morning and we used we brought down all the sites again to the to our data center and then we decided okay we are not going to go with cloud foundry deleted everything and then there was a then there was one decision point that we had to make okay let's go with something which is native to aws so then we started migrating all of our sites to the actual ec2 environment in aws because we had to scale up and there were hard limits on our uh, on our data centers. So, um, so I have a question. This, yeah. How sure. long was were you learning what was that duration that you were that you were experimenting with open source? How long was that? Uh I think it was from uh, 2017 until 2000 uh 18 March. September 2017 until um March 2018. So they lost a year of opportunity to move customers, right? right? So yep. I imagine yep. it was really fun to work at Moody's at this time. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I uh, thought I was Yeah. tall enough. Yeah, to but we got a lot of things. Woo. <laughs> <laughs> we had a lot of things to learn though along with yeah. that. So it was Yeah. yeah. So how do not make the same mistake? Yeah, your people have to know how to do this, right? And you have to be right. to realize if you have to solve that yourself. I think Mutual of Omaha has done a really good job with that. They run a lot of open source and but they have a lot of people and uh you know, they were able to do that, but not everybody is and you have to be realistic with what you're with what you're picking and ask those questions. So anyway, thank you. Sure. yeah so so the, again uh, when we started migrating to ec2 environment again there was a point of okay how do we scale how do we make sure our application stays available all the time so then we had to pivot away from even from ec2 to something which is natively like uh, managed by aws itself 
so that's when we started doing the poc in uh, in aws elastic beanstalk and that has proved one of the best decisions for our application and that has now grown to around 7673 plus sites in oregon and uh, and 17 and 23 plus sites in ireland and sydney uh, and and again when i say that we still had multiple issues while trying to you know make sure the application stays available and you know it scales up the and that that would be um, uh, uh, how do we want to make sure that uh, that thing does not happen uh, that was the actual journey for from and 2018 to 2020 that revenue stream is just shy of 350 million dollars annually so right it's a uh, very very high visibility project. Yep. So then uh, how did you get to the other regions? So when we started, so our first goal is to get one region up and running. And that's what, that's how we started developing everything in AOR. That is Amazon Oregon region. Um, then there was a need for like, okay, if we start putting everything in one region, then then there are there are DR issues, and then there is uh, uh, like uh, clients who are in other regions. How do they make sure that their data does not leave a region? Like there are compliance issues, compliance issues, right? So that's when we started uh, putting putting or developing or growing our uh, our footprint uh, into Ireland and Sydney region because that's where most of our clients are. So one thing I would like to add is as you scale, you have to really think about your deployment. When we first started doing this, we could deploy in a week and I was just kind of goofing around. Now my poor Singapore people have to work all night long for five weeks straight to deploy one chain to, or one version. So what happens if you have a hot, a, a hot fix or something that you need. Um, that's not sustainable over time. So, you know, we've become, we've struggled with this a lot in trying to make sure that we can handle that velocity and can deploy, you know, hundreds of sites at a time as opposed to, um, you know, five weeks. And these are hard things to do because now you're in a real production environment. Um, and you have to think about what times you can do these things. You can't deploy to um, these Oregon sites in the day. These are banks. So you have to do this at night. Um, and, you know, my team really loves working day and night. So that's a problem. Um, then you have, then you have people that, um, that they, they actually do work in the Caribbean. So they're technically, you would think, in the United States, but they want to be hosted in um, Ireland. Well, so that messes with your, the time zones. So, you know, it's still daytime for them and they don't want to go down in the Cayman Islands. That might be a major banking hub, I'm, I'm thinking. So um, if you have offshore money there and you host it in Ireland, that's probably not a good decision. So you need to think about those types of things when you're placing your clients or be able to move them so that they aren't subjected to outages during their business hours. So these are just things to consider. Okay. Right. And so, then, and then uh, uh, plus we have to also think about like the time duration it takes for like, we cannot go past the change window. Otherwise there would be issues. Yep. So we have to, so that, we have to think all of, about all of that. Sorry. No, that's okay. Thank you for sharing that history and thank you for enduring that while I was not there. So I really appreciate that a lot. Um, and thank you for my other team for not making me endure that ever. Um, so now we wanted to talk about some really more interesting things that if you guys are interested in one of these more than the, than the other, that's fine. We don't have to go through all of them, but these are really, really problem areas that we've had at scale in uh, AWS trying to get there. And I wanted to share them with you so that you could 
so that you could maybe take notes and, and think about this as you're working toward um, scaling and using containers and different things, because I'm sure you'll probably run into them. I don't think we're that special, but um, you probably, I know that Mutual had some of the same um, challenges as well. I know we talked about lag, log aggregation for at least a year. Uh, and then I don't know what they're doing now, but um, we're still struggling with some of these things. And we wanted to talk about those and, and really have an interactive discussion with you guys. So feel free to ask us questions and we'll share what we know um, because this is really golden nuggets um, of things that you might run into and how you might get around those. So with that, the first one I'm gonna let Vihang speak to because it's near and dear to his heart, which is um, AWS limits, soft, hard limits. What does that even mean? Please tell us what you know. Sure. So our primary provider for the cloud, AWS, uh, has, there are, there, are, as there, there are soft limits, there are hard limits, and then there are throttling limits. So I'll talk about each of them, right? So I'll start with the hard limits. So AWS has, when, when, when you open an account or when you create an account with AWS, um, there, is a, there is a default limit uh, for, for all the resources. There are some of them are soft and some of them are hard. When we say hard limits, it means, uh, like let's say Global Accelerator is one of the resource or one of the, um, one of the resource with AWS, you cannot scale like more than five in a in one account. Uh, so that is a hard limit, right? We have to architect our application in a certain way that we don't hit into that issues when we start scaling up. So that 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 is a hard limit. Soft limit is uh, is again um, when we when we start there are there is a default limit for like let's say uh, a certain type of servers, like you can only create fifty in the when you start the account. So you have to uh, contact them and create a create a ticket for them to increase to what you want to scale your application to, uh, and that applies to to multiple resources like EC2, CloudFormation, uh, RDS, Lambda, all of that. Uh, when the third point I would I would like to bring is the throttling. So that is as what Christy is mentioning is it's uh, more near and dear to me because. Uh, as we we solved one problem of of putting our application in a uh, in elastic beanstalk. Now, how do we scale that? How do we make sure our deployment window is is not five weeks, but less than two weeks, right? So we had to increase the number of sites or number of upgrades we have to deploy per night. But when we start doing that, we we start hitting into the issues where where the number of API calls that we can make per second to any AWS service uh, is, is, is getting capped out. So that's how we started, that's how when we started to uh, find out like uh, this, is, this is a throttling issue. So we have to, we have to re-architect our deployment in a certain way that it can start retrying those API calls. So it does not error out. Uh, so so that, that was the major, these are the three major, uh, uh, major uh, uh, Issues that we had when when we started scaling up and started decreasing our uh, our time our uh, deployment times. What is a so, what is a second uh, challenge, Christy? So and then I was a in and over the chat as well as what is what are the sorry my my phone my it scrolled on me right the last second. What are the issues that prevent zero downtime deployment? <laughs> So, so the issues that prevent zero downtime again, uh, uh, what happens is uh, when we when we start when we start utilizing Elastic Beanstalk as a as a service, uh, Elastic Beanstalk offers multiple ways to have uh, less zero downtime. Uh, so if you if you do not uh, consider your your option settings in a certain way, like you want to deploy an application all at once, it means there would be a downtime, but then there is something which is called as immutable updates in Elastic Beanstalk. That would make sure that your environments get created along with the along with your current environment, deploys the app, makes sure it works fine, and then switches to the to the scaling group, right? That that way we can prevent the, the downtime. 
if i if i answer the uh, question uh, correctly so let the let the chat window decide is there further follow up that's <laughs> wanted on that um, right this is scott go ahead scott um no i guess i was yeah because i was trying to understand if um if you can kind of roll out updates so that um assuming you've got redundancy across those services, I guess I was just trying to figure out um, what, what's the, is it, you know, is it that you've got incompatible states of code or there's database changes where you can't have the service, you know, like do, you know, can, do they all have to change at once or can you kind of do a rolling change? Um, is, I, that's why I was just trying to yeah. understand. And sometimes depending on what you're implementing your services in the startup time, is so is too long, you know. If you especially if you have, you know, things that take thirty or forty seconds to start. Uh, so I, I was just trying to understand right. what what those impediments are. Yeah. Yes. So so one of the impediments is as you mentioned the rolling updates, right? Uh, it also depends on the the type of application that we are running. Uh, like let's say if if an application does not support load balancing there is no point in doing rolling updates because you are, you are only running one uh, server behind an auto scaling group. Uh, so, so there are, there are three different things, right? You can deploy all at once. You can do a rolling one or either you can do a blue green deployment. Uh, yeah. That way your, your environment, uh, your environment does not have a downtime. It just switches the DNS. Yeah. So, so, so I guess so yeah, you're, go ahead. So to your point, Vahang, in the, so this was a non-cloud native app. And so when they first started, they sold, you know, the stuff and then we had to make, you know, make it work what we have. And so we couldn't really, we didn't have a it load balance until very recently, which is scary. They had, they had another node, but it was, it was not automatic. Um, and so now they have that, but that's pretty recent. Um, Another issue that they had was there's a lot of these customizations for certain clients. They didn't force standardization. So if it was forced into like an auto scale event or something, it would lose all those customizations. And that's an issue as well. Um, right. Yeah. For the bigger so, banks. Because, yeah. you know, that happens when you sell the U.S. bank. They want it their way. Right. Or McDonald's. Right. You have to have it their way. Uh, or is that Burger King? I don't remember which one. Um, but anyway, yeah. that makes it really, really hard because um, then you'll have to apply them after the fact. And AWS even has bugs where in their auto scaling, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't always work the way you think it, it does. So um, that's also been a challenge. Okay, great. Thanks for explaining that. I appreciate that. Uh, well, are you guys having those issues too? Um, I haven't yet, but I'm not doing the type of scaling that you're doing. Um, so, you know, we've been pretty fortunate uh, on the smaller apps that I've worked on to be able to, um, you know, it seems like the deployments happen almost instantaneously um, and they're all stateless. Yeah, um, that's right. a major advantage. <laughs> we, yeah. I think we will get there, um, but it, it's going to take some time to do that. Um, I don't know if we'll ever get, we'll probably have some instances that are and some that aren't, depending on, on how much they want to push back on the clients. But um, again, that, that's hard because that's not really our decision, right? It's whatever they've sold them, it's what's in the contract and what they negotiate. So um, sometimes we have to do like really crazy things and Vahang will come up with ideas like, oh, I'm going to write a Lambda function that's going to get invoked after, you know, someone stands on one foot and turns in a circle three times and then, um, you know, we'll kick it off and, and fix whatever the problem is. But um, it's, it's hard to, to do this when you, when you don't, when you hold state. Yes. Yep. Yeah. I, I think state full applications would be really, really hard to, manage in the cloud um, yeah it is that's why yeah. it gets up there <laughs> okay. I wanted and again when we start out. when we start sorry Christy, go ahead. it's okay 
so what i think is when we start doing multi tenancy uh, then we can remove those those stiffness yeah. uh, out of that and then we can have the true uh, leverage of the service yeah and at least in my current environment multi tenancy isn't even an issue for us so it's it's uh it's we're the problem is completely different yeah I think um, it's been really hard because it, it really impacts the, the networking and infrastructure teams significantly to be able to do this. Um, speaking of that, I, I also wanted to point out, because um, I, I know a lot of companies do this. So for example, when we talk about Beanstalk, the nice thing about that is that you're using um, the containers managing everything. So if you're in operations and let's say you lose a customer, not that we've ever have, but let's say we did, um, then you don't want to pay for these EC2 instances that are up, right? Why would you pay for compute for stuff you're not using? So you have to tear that stuff down. Well, when you take, when you use that service and you delete one of them, it takes care of all of that for you. It deletes all the associated pieces and components with that. Well, if you start mixing stuff, like for example, most companies will use a Palo Alto firewall um, and they will put them on the perimeter of their network because other clients that they sell to, they, that's kind of known as, it's like the Cadillac of firewalls, right? It's, it's supposedly the most secure. And it's more than just a firewall. It does other things like routing and filtering and and all kinds of things that I didn't know or care about when I was a developer. Um, but now that I have to care about that, um, now when we make changes to those, um, we have to make sure that, you know, anytime we change the AWS environment, it doesn't automatically mean the, the firewalls are configured properly. And you have to tear them down and you have to make sure that you have enough um, IPs or, or network addresses, NATs, so they call them um, built so that you can deploy that because we hit limits on our infrastructure as well. And so we have to do a, you know, if you can, it's really nice if you can use the services within the ecosystem. I understand that you can't do that always and the security, this is another thing, you're gonna have to get really familiar with security because security, they have to stand in front of auditors and explain this. And when you, they don't like to use all of the Amazon services because it, it's harder for them to deal with audits. So you're going to end up um, doing a lot of work with security that um, you may not have realized. Um, patching is very difficult as well if you're not using um, their automated patching once a month. And, you know, again, if it, if it causes an outage and you're supposed to tell your clients, you can't just let Amazon do it whenever they feel like it. So that is a really big challenge for us as well. So you're talking about patching EC2 or you're patching your Docker images that you're um, deploying? Well, we don't have Docker images, so they're not patching oh. those. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. So I, do you want to explain how we do the patching today? Uh -huh, and, and what the future looks yeah. like. Yeah, definitely. So in so basically we we majorly use Elastic Beanstalk as our service, right? And Elastic Beanstalk has something called as managed updates. So what it does is every uh, every month AWS releases one AMI special, uh, specifically for Elastic Beanstalk that will include all the Microsoft patches that is required that has that has come out all the zero day patches, everything for that month, you can actually use that image instantaneously when we start when we start doing the upgrades or start using the managed update process, it would it would do it in the in the maintenance window that we specify. So that's how we patch that's how we patch all of our uh, our beanstalk services or beanstalk servers. And then other other than other than that we all of our uh, servers are domain joined. So they can directly push the the updates uh, they're on. So I'm just going to do a quick time check here because we can give, we're going to let you all choose your journey. So we can go on here with, um, if anybody wants to call out and chat or unmute yourself and ask a question to Christy and Vihang, um, we can certainly do that. We also have the option of going into a small group sessions and so that you can talk about this within 
a smaller group of your peers instead of the larger group of your peers and probably still come back and throw a question or two at, at Christy and Behind. So I'm going to let you choose your journey. So thumbs up if you want to stay all together in one group. Please just use the reactions for that. Or the wave, if you're like, you know, a small group discussion would be good. There's a lot of thumbs coming up. Okay, so I think anybody else wanting to vote? So, um, if I, so I believe we're all wanting to stick together and to hear whatever else Christian Viang have to say, um, which is great. And I did see some heads nodding as you were giving these words of wisdom. So appreciate <laughs> appreciate the the wisdom that you're handing out here for all of us to, to learn learn from your journey. So does anybody have a specific bullet that you'd like to make sure that Christy and Vihang have, have addressed before we before we move on? Otherwise I'm gonna just step back and let let them keep talking. So I'm surprised nobody's asked us about uh, lambda functions yet. Tell us about lambda functions, Christy. Oh, or Vahang. Um, Vahang. Yes. Vahang, tell us about Let's lambda let our functions. Let's certified architect who actually wrote them discuss what we have in lambda. And what does that so, mean yeah. for vendor lock-in for us managers right. who are not tall enough to so, do that? Yeah, so so lambda functions uh, basically uh, uh, basically works at on on an event basis. So let's let's say I'll talk about auto scaling because that that is a part of Elastic Beanstalk. So how how do we get notified when a scaling happens in our environment which is so large at this point? Like how do we get to know that okay this is some site which is down or some scaling activity that is going on? So whenever a scaling activity or scaling event that happens, uh, Elastic or, or in, in AWS, there is something called as CloudWatch event. Uh, that, that generates a CloudWatch event. We can, we can use that event to, to, to pipe it out to a Lambda function and that function we can, we can write it in a certain way that it behaves in a way that it can send out notifications or do something in the environment so, so as soon as the event arrives, right? As soon as the event arrives, it it instantaneously invokes the function, and that function takes care of, like, let's say, notifying cloud ops. Like, okay, there is a scaling event going on. Uh, start. So before even customer calls us, we are we are on uh, to see what's going on. So that's how Lambda functions work. So how many of those do we have and why do we have them? Is that going to cause us uh, vendor lock-in? What if I want to go to Azure next week? Can I do that? You could do that for sure. This, this Lambda functions are, are written in Python or Node.js or, or whatever language you can specify. If, if a vendor supports that language, you can totally migrate all of, all of your code to a different vendor. It's not vendor logged. Okay. And, oh, I have one Yeah, other. and we do have. Yeah, go ahead. And that's okay. Finish the Lambda thing, and then I want to talk about deployments. Yeah, so we do have, we do have, uh, I think we have around, around 10 of these functions that, that are on, uh, that are on the, uh, on our, on our radar, that whenever certain things happen, it, it does something that can, uh, that can help us being proactive. So, Christy, are you yeah. satisfied with the answer response? I'll talk to him about it later. <laughs> <laughs> we'll chat. Uh, yes, that's right. I, I did want to talk a little bit about, because this is kind of an interesting topic. You have to think so, about deployments. Christy, there, it, yeah. there is a question that came in on the chat. So, how does oh, okay. QA happen? Pardon? How does QA happen with the scale? That's how it's worded in the chat. Oh, they are ruthless. So um, we have a DevOps team um, with probably the most laser-focused manager I've ever seen. We like him a lot. 
but he, uh, so he, what he has done is we try to, remember we're global, so we, we have people that are developing and designing this stuff in San Francisco. They, they, they do tell me they're doing stuff for us, not to us, but I'm not sure I always believe that. Um, so anyway, but we've made friends with them, but the, the DevOps piece is the piece in the middle. And then they start writing and they, they, what they, and they test all this code. So the code goes into GitHub and then they um, test it and they build these packages um, for, for credit lens. And they also have one for the deployment um, platform called, um, it's called Falcon. Um, oddly enough, the, the testing one, I think there's a tool called Garuda, which I didn't know means eagle in, in, in the Indian language. Is that what that means? Okay, so we're all birds, but they're in different languages. So that makes it hard for me to know which one. But um, it just depends where it was developed. So, so anyway, they, what they call it is the SDLC. And then nothing, everything gets changed um, on, they, we, we like to think of it as shift left, right? So Vahong doesn't make any code changes. If there's a problem, it goes all the way back to the beginning. And then they go and they, they rebuild the code. It's passed over to the QA. And we have very, very extensive testing. You cannot be a vendor and stay in business if you have a bunch of buggy code. So um, they're very, very particular about testing. They have lots of testing automation. Um, they also have a lot of um, like ancillary type of components where they do, um, Vahong knows most of them, I don't know, what are they, Seal Studio, there's um, some file transfer, yeah. there's a lot of things like this. Um, and right. So they have and people that specialize in that as well. Yep. The, the other good thing about QA at scale is if you have a separate account, like a separate AWS account altogether, you can actually leverage that whole account to only do the testing of your application at scale. You can scale your, your environment mm -hmm. up and down depending on, on your sizing. Like if you are doing a regression testing or if you are doing a, a smoke test, right? You have to scale your application at such level, but that if that is a, if that account is, is completely separate than production, all of your clients are safe. And they, they don't allow us access to that at all. So, so they'll sit there and then they'll do some load testing and a whole bunch of tests. It's very, it's like two weeks of, and they, they iterate through this. And they have a very, very strict um, rule of how this, this happens. And then um, we never ever, well, test in production except for this last week. Um, where I made an exception because we were trying to double the number of sites that we could deploy because as I was saying, we, we can't continue to do these five week windows, right? That's not sustainable. So, but even though we try to make the environments as close as possible, um, they're not identical. For example, um, the, the types of load that you have, like US Bank has a very large database, as you can imagine. Um, and that's on an RDS instance. They only have one RDS instance in the non-prod environment, but in production we have 12. And, and the way that they're spread across could be different and it could perform differently than it performs in non-prod. So, you know, we're trying to bring these as close together as possible, but sometimes um, we will create uh, not real sites, but uh, we, we have some like validation sites is what we call them, but really you're still testing in production. And then we'll delete them when we're done. And we'll, we'll Vihan created like 50 of them, even though I wanted a hundred. He did compromise and gave me 75. So I think I'll let him come back to work next week. But- um, <laughs> Christy and I sure. negotiate on this like- <laughs> <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yeah. You guys have a, have a big camaraderie there. So I we know. do have one more question that came in on the chat and I think if you'll take a quick stab at that question and then it's looking at the time it's 6 30 so if All you'd right. like to take the question that's there um, it's the does using lambdas instead of ec2 help with how long it takes to do deployment so uh, yes so for sure lambda instead of ec2 will do the deployment but there is a uh, but how it works is lambda has a certain uh, time limit like you cannot 
you cannot run your function for more than five minutes, right? And if your deployment takes like, let's say 30 or 40 minutes, then Lambda function is not a kind of a help to you in doing the deployments. Okay. Don't there roll your have... own deployment code. That's the other thing I want to tell you. <laughs> Otherwise, you, you get to test that as well. Don't you? So I appreciate you being so so giving with your words of wisdom there. Um, so I don't know what the best way is, if, or any resources that you would point people to if they've got questions for this going forward. Any favorite websites or do you Slack or what's your Stack Overflow? What's your best best people, best way to get people to answers that they need if they want to research this further? How did you get so smart on it? Well, I, I would, I would suggest. <laughs> oh, behind. Okay. Yeah. So I think the best, the best documentation is is going over to a vendor site like AWS and look for what are the they have they have a very detailed documentation that would outline everything or all of your questions that you have. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And we're going to, Christy, if you stop sharing your screen, I'm ready to give away some prizes. Oh, yeah. I think you should give away some prizes. But we should. I don't think we they need to. They have it. earned it. So thanks so much. <laughs>